Welcome to the industry specific applications module of networking fundamentals for the industrial control systems course. The goal of this course is to enable learners to assimilate the information presented in further training courses such as the managing industrial networks with Cisco networking technologies. This module will discuss concepts and protocols needed to support the industrial automation network environment and compare those to the concepts and protocols used in the IT network. The concepts will include convergence, network architectures and topologies, the protocols used in the automation network, wireless networking, security and network management, as well as additional support protocols. Module Objectives After you complete this module, you will be able to relate the networking concepts learned earlier in this course to their application within the automation industry network context, explain the concept of convergence within the automation industry, identify similarities between industry protocols and the OSI model, identify the types of equipment and protocols found in the automation network environment, present a brief overview of industrial Ethernet topologies including linear, star and ring, identify standardized protocols as the automation industry network implements the protocols, describe the role of wireless technologies within the industrial network, and identify the benefit of precision time protocol and other support protocols in automated networks. In this lesson, you will be introduced to the basics of what an automation network is and the considerations and protocols of this network environment. This lesson includes multiple industry verticals and technologies and a look at how implemented automation network standards compare with IT networks. In order to understand the differences and similarities of IT and automation industry networks, as well as the impact of convergence and open standards, let us first explore the traditional implementation of these networks. The illustration here provides an example of a typical automation network. The network architecture that is shown relies on numerous technologies to enable communication on the plant floor. The technologies that are implemented are often purpose-built and vendor-specific. As we can see here, a corporate IT network supports traditional administrative functions. Among these functions are corporate applications such as human resources HR, enterprise resource planning ERP, accounting, procurement, sales, inventory, manufacturing controls, and many others. This type of network is usually based on the Ethernet and TCP IP standards discussed earlier in this course. The control network in this illustration connects control and monitoring devices, including PLCs, PC-based controllers, and human-machine interfaces, or HMIs. This network is not standard Ethernet, and the network requires a gateway to translate application-specific protocols to Ethernet-based protocols. A proprietary network, known as Fieldbus, links the plant floor, input-output devices, including sensors, transducers, photo eyes and flow meters, and other automation and motion equipment, robotics, variable frequency drives, and actuators. Interconnectivity between these devices is traditionally achieved with proprietary field bus protocols. Each protocol has specific power, cable, and communication requirements, depending on the factory application that the protocol supports. Using proprietary protocols can lead to duplication of networks in the same physical space. This duplication can be costly, resulting in multiple spares, support programs, resources, and skills that are required within the same organization. Today, the typical manufacturing network flow includes a combination of Ethernet components, control network devices, and field bus devices. Ethernet is used to operate office applications and to store data on data services and back office mainframe servers. The control network allows individuals to monitor and maintain the assembly process from a central location or from control stations located throughout the floor. And lastly, field bus is most commonly used in the assembly process on robotics, motors, drives, actuators, sensors, and other input-output devices throughout the floor. In order to understand the differences and similarities of IT and automation industry networks, 
as well as the impact of convergence and open standards, let us first explore the traditional implementation of these networks. The illustration in addition to standards, there are several organizations that focus on industrial protocols. The two most dominant organizations are ODVA and Profibus and Profinet International. ODVA is an international organization that was formed to focus on Common Industrial Protocol or CIP. ODVA technologies include DeviceNet, Ethernet Stroke IP, Componet and ControlNet. Profibus and Profinet International focus on field bus communication standards in the automation community. PI offers solutions, training and provides support to organizations who are installing or maintaining Profibus and Profinet products. Fieldbus is a group of industrial communications protocols commonly used to join IACS components, such as Programmable Logic Controllers PLC, to sensors, actuators, drives and other automation end devices. Some Fieldbus examples include Foundation Fieldbus, ControlNet and Profibus. Fieldbus is commonly used in manufacturing because of the following. Firstly, a multi-drop line, optimizing cabling usage, communication between multiple devices on a shared bus, and possible reliability for real-time communication. However, Fieldbus connections are limited. Unlike Ethernet, which allows all devices on the same network to communicate, Fieldbus communication is transmitted only between the devices that share their local bus. And also, unlike Ethernet, where devices all speak the same language, recognized field bus protocols are not interchangeable. Connecting unlike field bus devices to one another is difficult and in some cases impossible because they are proprietary. In the manufacturing industry, field bus devices are currently more common than Ethernet. The majority of these field bus devices are found in the manufacturing automation process on components such as sensors and other input output devices. Currently the ratio is 30 to 100 field bus devices for every one Ethernet device. However, Ethernet is emerging because it allows interconnected communications between many devices on the automation network and provides the ability to control these devices through a central control system. Open communication between devices is driving the migration from field bus to Ethernet. In addition, Ethernet provides manufacturing the advantages of being inexpensive and fast. In the coming years, a large portion of those 30 to 100 field bus devices will migrate to Ethernet. Switched Ethernet networks offer real-time performance, including minimal latency, jitter and packet loss avoidance capabilities. These capabilities meet or exceed the needs of most industrial applications. In addition, these modern networks have evolved mature, tested technologies to safely secure the network. These networks also secure the systems that the networks interconnect beyond what is available for older field bus networks. Cisco has proposed the Converged Plant-Wide Ethernet or CPWE architecture. The architecture provides standard network services to applications, devices and equipment that is found in many modern industrial applications and integrates the services into the wider enterprise network. Cisco outlines the basics of Industrial Automation Control Systems or IACS to business network convergence and documents that information in the Ethernet to the Factory Design and Implementation Guide. Ethernet to the Factory or ETTF outlines a logical networking framework that is built on industry standards and provides best practices and guidance for basic networking designs and implementation. This shift towards convergence in the industrial environment is more than just a shift to implementing standardized protocols, but it's also a shift towards uniting the industrial and enterprise network environment. Given the push towards convergence, converged industrial Ethernet is now becoming more prevalent in industrial networking. Ethernet is replacing old and proprietary communications. Now here are some of the advantages of converged industrial Ethernet. Firstly, the globalization of data communication from industrial control systems to an enterprise network. 
reduce cost of implementation with standard versus proprietary network equipment. Reduce cost of implementation with a common standard versus proprietary protocols. Reduce cost in total operations as five or six networks, for example, IP, control, device, motion and safety, consolidate into one overall network. Improved efficiency through converged technologies. And lastly, there's increased insight through secure remote access. Plant-wide networks differ from typical enterprise IT networks in a few ways. This illustration highlights differences between converged plant-wide Ethernet architectures and typical enterprise networks. The significant differences include the following. A demilitarized zone, or DMZ, segments industrial Ethernet networks from enterprise networks. Cell area zone networks that use industrial automation control systems require different topologies and configurations than typical enterprise networks. And endpoints in the IACS often connect multiple devices onto one switch, forming a device level topology. As you can see, there are some specific differences in the industrial control network and the enterprise network environment. In the industrial automation network, the physical architecture is a small portion of the overall architecture. Let us take a look at a typical model for a manufacturing control system. The Purdue Enterprise Reference Architecture, or PERA, model divides control system network elements into five levels. Level five is the enterprise network. And this is where the centralized IT systems and functions exist. Enterprise resource management, business to business, and business to customer services are typically located here. In level four, the site business planning and logistics network is where functions and systems exist that require access to services provided by the enterprise network. A manufacturing zone comprises of the following. Levels zero to two. In these levels, there are incorporated into the cell area zone, as well as level three. Level three, the site manufacturing operations and control systems manage the plant manufacturing wide functions. These systems may communicate with controllers in level one, function as a staging area for changes in the cell area zone, and share data with the enterprise, which is levels four and five, systems and applications. Because these systems are primarily based on standard computing equipment and operating systems, these systems are more likely to communicate with standard networking protocols. A cell area zone comprises the following. Level two, area supervisory control, which represents the systems and functions associated with the runtime supervision and operations of a cell area zone. Depending on the size and complexity of the application, these functions may also carry over to level three. Level one basic control consists of interfaces to the level zero devices, input output, linking devices, bridges, and so on, and controllers. The controllers may be standalone in single controller applications or multiple controllers on a peer-to-peer -peer network. Level zero, process, is comprised of a wide variety of sensors and devices to monitor and control both discrete and analog variables. The sensors and device perform the basic functions of monitoring and controlling the serial area zone. Devices can be traditional, hardwired devices, or more sophisticated network devices which take advantage of advanced configuration and status information. Critical to cell area levels are the environmental conditions in which the network infrastructure operates. Important considerations when selecting network components include the following. Extended temperature ranges must be supported. Humidity tolerance. Shock and vibration resistance. Electromagnetic constraints and surge protection immunity to noise, support of various power input options, including AC or DC inputs, support for various media types, fiber and copper, for example, flexible port configurations and mounting options. Safety zone exists to monitor the manufacturing environment and provide a fail safe shutdown function in order to protect personnel, machinery and the IACS from a hazardous event. In the industrial network model, the manufacturing zone consists of the following. Level three, which includes automation applications such as factory talk, servers and workstations. 
network services which provide manufacturing operations and control, layer 2 or layer 3 switches to connect all level 3 components. These features are similar in responsibility to the functions of the TCP IP protocol applications and networking support layers. Factory Talk is a modular approach to networking in a manufacturing environment. The Factory Talk Services platform is the foundation of Factory Talk applications. Factory Talk Services is comprised of a set of common software services that form a Service Oriented Architecture, or SOA. The Factory Talk Services platform allows applications to be developed that share common definitions, administration, real time data, and so on. The Factory Services platform is grouped by the following functionalities. Factory Talk Security allows centralized management of the rights and privileges of each user based on the role and location of the user. Factory Talk Directory allows sharing of common definitions such as users, tags, alarms, or graphic displays. Factory Talk Diagnostics and Audit provides common message formats, storage, and viewing, and also tracks the changes that are made within an application. Factory Talk Live Data allows real-time communication between software applications as well as third-party Open Peripheral Controller or OPC data service. Factory Talk Alarms and Events provide unified alarm definitions and common management between Logic's programmable automation controllers and software applications. Network services include Domain Name System DNS, DHCP, Syslog Server and network and security management applications. Also in this logical framework is a demilitarized zone, or DMZ. This zone is inserted between the enterprise and manufacturing zones as part of the converged plant-wide Ethernet architecture developed by Cisco and Rockwell Automation. The DMZ provides a buffer zone where data and services can be shared between the enterprise and manufacturing zones similar to the way a DMZ provides access to corporate resources shared with the outside world. The DMZ is critical in maintaining availability, addressing security vulnerabilities of the manufacturing environment, and abiding by regulatory compliance mandates. In addition, the DMZ allows segmentation of organizational control for the network. The industrial environment is harsh and requires devices that are compliant with International Electrotechnical Commission, or IEC, 60529, and the requirements of the National Electrical Manufacturers Association, NEMA, industrial protocol support is needed to integrate with automation management. And this topic describes industrial networking requirements. The industrial network infrastructure and end devices are located in harsh environments that require additional protection from elements, such as excessive heat, vibration, and electromagnetic interference, or EMI. The IEC 60529 standard defines the degrees of protection that enclosures of electrical equipment must provide. The NEMA 250 standard defines types of enclosures for indoor and hazardous environments. An industrial IP network has different communication patterns and protocols, like the Common Industrial Protocol, CIP, Profinet, and Modbus TCP, which are required by the manufacturing processes that the network supports. Real-time communication is another specific requirement in industrial applications. Messages must be communicated with latency and jitter, the variance of the latency, that are much lower than in typical enterprise applications. Interoperability guarantees that the network and end devices can interoperate using standard, common protocols like Ethernet, IP, and TCP UDP. TCP IP protocols, likewise, provide easy integration with IT infrastructure. Interoperability also enables remote management and monitoring with standard IP tools. How do enterprise and industrial networks compare to the converged network environment? Well, Typical uses for enterprise networks include data processing, such as voice, video, and data applications, whereas industrial networks can include voice, video, and data as well, but they can also focus on remote access, ERP, information, and control of physical equipment, such as safety synchronization and motion. Enterprise networks are typically accessed from a corporate or home environment, 
while industrial networks are accessed in manufacturing, processing and other industrial environments. Network failure in an enterprise network is inconvenient and can impact enterprise productivity. However, in an industrial environment, network failure is costly because it could stop operations and potentially cause equipment damage or other safety issues. Both implement standardized IP protocols, though industrial networks also implement proprietary industrial protocols. Enterprise networks exist on a wide area network, or WAN, providing connectivity between multiple facilities, while industrial networks typically exist within one building or a single facility. Latency and jitter conditions are issues in both IT and industrial environments. However, the consequences for these issues in industrial networks tend to be much more severe. Latency occurs when transmissions between one device and another are delayed, and jitter occurs when packets are received at an inconsistent arrival rate. In an industrial control system, the arrival rate is tighter because automation applications require precision in order to handle control, safety, motion control, and the synchronization of device actions. Latency and jitter in this environment could translate to a high number of production errors. In an enterprise network, which is used for voice and video communications, latency may be tolerated in the 100 millisecond range, but in an industrial network, the latency tolerance is much tighter in the 1 to 10 millisecond range with sub millisecond jitter. IP addressing differs, as enterprise networks are typically allocated dynamically through a DHCP server, while industrial networks utilize static addressing for consistency of control. And lastly, both networks require security features. Security is pervasive in enterprise networks, implementing many different layers of protection, whereas industrial networks, which are open access networks by default, strive for accessibility and ease of use. Industrial network security focuses on network uptime to keep the manufacturing process running 24-7. Security features should not interfere with production. Highly competitive industries, such as the oil and gas and mining industries, are driving companies to improve efficiency, productivity and safety. A robust and adaptive industrial Ethernet network infrastructure that is always available is critical to the success of an industrial network implementation of this type. There are several key IT requirements for such architectures, including the following. Availability and redundancy, wireless connectivity, secure remote access. Other requirements include the use of fiber optics and video over IP. The first key goal for an industrial network is availability and redundancy. Access to data and the network in the process and cell area zone must be managed and controlled to maintain the availability and stability of an industrial network. For example, best practices of implementing the process zone would include replicating critical network services in the process zone while considering the following. Domain services, for example, LDAP or Active Directory, Naming services, for example, DNS. IP address services, for example, DHCP, though in an industrial network, static IPs are normally used. Time services, for example, NTP or PTP. Applying redundant network routers, switches and links to maintain overall network availability. And utilizing redundant topologies to achieve availability, such as ring or dual ring, redundant star, full mesh and partial mesh topologies. For critical applications, it is recommended to use a dual channel redundant architecture on both the operation and machine control units. With two processes each, a master and slave processor, each processor performs the same functions and compares results periodically. If any inconsistencies or failures are detected, an alert is declared and the system stops. Mining, for example, is carried out in extremely hazardous environments. Safe and efficient mining operations expect devices, equipment and personnel to function in outdoor weather conditions, extreme heat and in close proximity to extreme shock and vibration. Vibrations caused by mining blasts, rough road conditions and moving heavy rock through processing can be passed on to devices, 
and may damage or destroy equipment. In order to guarantee mechanical stability and offer reliable operation under these conditions, high performance ruggedized network equipment should always be used. Network equipment needs to pass a variety of testing and certification to ensure normal functioning under industrial network conditions such as those found in the oil and gas and mining industry. An example of extreme temperature conditions in the industrial network environment is again found in the mining industry. When mining metals such as copper or gold, a process known as smelting is used to liquefy the metal, extracting the metal from rock and earth. Extreme temperatures inside smelting plants can be up to 55 degrees centigrade. This operating environment is harmful to most electronic devices. Maintaining network quality under such conditions is critical, therefore environmental operating ranges should be noted when developing a network approach. Network cabling and equipment in these environments must be engineered to withstand these extreme environmental conditions. For example, Cisco 2K and 3K switches have been engineered to operate within the wide temperature range needed for these environments. Just as in the enterprise IT environment, having communication standards and standards organizations is necessary. These same requirements exist in the industrial networking environment. A variety of communication standards are used at all levels to control the mining process in the mining network. These standards are similar to the same ones used in oil and gas industry networks. The communication standards and protocols used include Profinet, provides a fast and reliable way to access powerful diagnostic information and troubleshoot issues quickly. Profibus, links control systems with field devices such as sensors and actuators. This protocol enables a consistent data exchange with higher ranking communication systems, which supports the automated mining process, as well as in-motion control and safety related tasks. Modbus, a serial communications protocol which is often used in connecting industrial electronic devices. Modbus enables communication for up to 240 devices on the same network. Modbus is commonly used to connect a remote terminal unit, or RTU, with supervisory control and data acquisition, SCADA, systems. Some mines have introduced Modbus TCP to take advantage of cost-efficient Ethernet network cards, switches, routers, and cabling. And lastly, Ethernet IP. Used together with CIP Sync and CIP Motion Technologies, it enables real-time control for motion control applications. Profinet is one of the multibus Ethernet-based standards for the automation industry. This standard allows integration with IT and field bus systems. Profinet input-output supports real-time automation and is built on Ethernet and TCPI standards. There are three different implementation versions of Profinet each of which has been optimized for different applications. Some implement non-standard protocols, other versions do not use the TCP IP layers included in the architecture. The three protocol levels defined for Profinet include Profinet TCP IP. Profinet TCP IP is used for non-deterministic functions such as parameterization, video and audio transmissions, and data transfer to higher level IT systems. Profinet RT. The TCP IP layers are bypassed in order to give deterministic performance for automation applications in the 1 to 10 millisecond range. This ability represents a software-based solution suitable for typical input-output applications, including motion control and high performance requirements. Profinet Isynchronous Real-Time, or IRT. At this level, signal prioritization and scheduled switching deliver high precision synchronization for applications such as motion control. Cycle rates in the sub-millisecond range are possible with jitter in the sub-microsecond range. This service requires hardware support in the form of readily available ASICs. In each of these implementations, Profinet protocol does some portion of the OSI model function. Modbus is a serial communications protocol originally published by Modicon for use with its Programmable Logical Controllers, or PLCs. It is an open master-slave protocol that can be used, for example, from PLC to an input-output device. 
Modbus is common in an industrial system because it allows the master to transmit messages that are picked up by multiple slave devices on the same segment. Modbus TCP IP, also Modbus TCP, is simply the Modbus RTU protocol with a TCP interface, which runs on Ethernet. In this figure, the Modbus TCP master can either wait for each response to return before the next request is issued, or it can send several requests at once in order to allow for parallel processing in the slave devices. In the latter case, the overall performance is improved. The Modbus protocol is still in use in the automation world because Modbus can connect IP Ethernet networks. The main change in the modern network is that Modbus now uses TCP IP as a transmitting protocol. Another change is that instead of having one master and multiple slaves, Modbus now supports a client and server architecture. For example, HMIs or PLCs would be clients, while input output racks would be considered servers. Significantly, Modbus is no longer limited to one master with a number of slaves. Instead, any number of clients can access any number of servers. A Modbus TCP IP application data unit, or ADU, consists of the traditional Modbus protocol data unit, which is also present in the Modbus over serial line method, and a new Modbus application protocol header, shortly MBAP. The function code and data definitions of Modbus protocol data unit remain intact. TCP uses registered port 502 to send Modbus application data units through the TCP IP network. Modbus will continue to be popular for simplicity and the fact that there are many users with Modbus knowledge in the field. The IEC 61850 standard defines communications for substations. The IEC 61850 consists of the following protocols. Generic Object Oriented Substation Events, or GOOSE, uses a peer-to-peer -peer model or communication between the equals, similar to Ethernet IP, Implicit Messages and Profinet RT. Sample Value Service provides fast distribution for the digital output of voltage and current transformers inside of a substation. TimeSync is based on the Simple Network Time Protocol, or SNTP. Manufacturing Message Specification, or MMS, is a messaging system for transferring real-time process data and supervisory control information between IEDs, robots, programmable logical controllers, and PCs. And lastly, Generic Substation State Event, or GSSE, provides the capability to convey state change information with the identical functionality of GOOSE. The Generic Substation Event, or GSE, is a control model in substation networks. The GSE sends event messages to multiple receivers. The GSE is divided into two classes, the Generic Object Orientated Substation Event, or GOOSEs, or Generic Substation State Events, or GSSEs. GOOSE is used to exchange status messages between Intelligent Electronic Devices, or IEDs. GOOSE protocol data is encapsulated into Ethernet frames. IEEE 021Q is used to provide virtual LANs and to set a priority tag on the frames. GOOSE uses multicast MAC addresses or the broadcast MAC address to communicate. While serial communications remain widely used throughout the industrial networking world, Ethernet communications are becoming more prevalent for substation communications. Additional architectures and protocols used in the industrial environment include data exchange protocol models such as Common Industrial Protocol, or CIP Suite. CIP is an information exchange protocol for industrial automation applications. CIP allows users to integrate manufacturing applications with enterprise-level Ethernet networks and the Internet. CIP is a messaging protocol that defines how different industrial automation and control system network devices, systems and applications come together to form an application. Similar to the application protocols in the TCP IP protocol suite, CIP encompasses a comprehensive suite of messages and services for the collection of manufacturing automation applications. Those applications often include control, safety, synchronization, 
motion configuration and information systems. CIP exists on OSI layers 5 to 7 and is a single media independent platform that can be used across four layers sensor and actuator layer, device layer, controller layer and the internet layer. The four network adaptations of CIP that are available include ComponeNet on the sensor and actuator level is an ODVA network. It's not as common as the other three, but ComponeNet is a networking solution for the sensor and actuator layer of components. DeviceNet, which is on the device layer and was the first public implementation of CIP. DeviceNet employs a controller area network, or CAN, in Datalink. ControlNet, which lies on the controller layer. It is a deterministic digital communications network that provides high-speed transport of time-critical input-output and messaging data. ControlNet uses concurrent time domain multiple access, or CTDMA, in its data link layer for bus access. And lastly, Ethernet Industrial Protocol, or Ethernet IP, which is on the Internet layer. And it's the widely accepted industrial Ethernet network solution available for manufacturing automation. The important aspects of the CIP implementation of Ethernet IP are the various types of messaging that are used and how the types are implemented in standard Ethernet TCP IP. All connections in a CIP network can be divided into unconnected messaging, explicit messaging connections, and implicit or input-output messaging connections. Unconnected messaging in the CIP protocol is used to open a non-time-critical CIP connection with another device. Explicit messaging connections provide generic, multi-purpose communication paths between two devices. Explicit messages provide typical request and response-oriented network communication and are always made to the message router object. Each request contains explicit information that the receiving node decodes, acts upon, and then generate an appropriate response. Implicit messaging connections provide dedicated special purpose communication paths or ports between a producing application object and one or more consuming application objects. This type of messaging is always used for application specific input output data that moves through these ports and so the messaging is often referred to as IO connections. The messages are called implicit messages because the data is exchanged, is identified at the time that the connection is established, and connection IDs are assigned. Again, we can see similarities between this environment and the TCP IP environment used for data exchanges in non-industrial networks. In this lesson, we take a look at the network components and topologies in converged industrial networks as well as a look at a vertical market considerations for the physical layer, data link, and network layer functions for these types of networks. The convergence of plant and enterprise networks may also create an unclear demarcation line for network ownership and responsibility. Groups that are traditionally limited interaction within manufacturing company networks now collaborate with each other. To support network convergence, control engineers and information technology professionals experience both organizational and cultural convergence. In the new network environment, sharing of best practices between engineering and IT is needed. The emergence of a manufacturing IT department distinct from the enterprise IT department takes this collaboration to a new level. There is now a need for a supporting role that is responsible for understanding the IT needs and requirements of the manufacturing network. Manufacturing organizations may decide to support industrial IT any number of ways. Manufacturing IT support may come from IT personnel who is embedded within the manufacturing network and acts as a liaison to the enterprise IT department, or enterprise IT may fully support manufacturing IT or enterprise and manufacturing IT departments merge under one IT umbrella. The decision will be company specific. In a converged network, collaboration is key. Enterprise IT might be focused on security, while manufacturing is focused on maintaining operations. However, everyone benefits when both the enterprise IT department 
and the manufacturing IT department are prepared to listen to the needs of each other. To help drive this shift to Ethernet IP, Rockwell Automation and Cisco collaborated on the development of the Converged Plant-Wide Ethernet, or CPWE. This is a validated network design that focuses on industrial IP networks comprised of anywhere from hundreds to tens of thousands of ICS or industrial control systems used in industrial automation. Let's expand on that a bit. Firstly, environment. Plant floor devices are often located in harsh climates, high or extreme temperatures, high levels of electromagnetic interference or vibration volatile structures. Ease of interconnecting. The key focus is ease of communication between different manufacturer-based devices by using standards-based protocols instead of proprietary protocols. Cost. In industrial environments, a single outage could be devastating to the production cost. CPWE takes that into account with redundancy and failover links. Security. Perhaps one of the most important features, mitigating exposure from outside intruders. And lastly, scalability. Ease of expanding the plant-wide architecture is addressed with improved scalability. As an example of an industrial network, mining industry networks consist of a number of subsystems. These networks are similar to the networks in any type of manufacturing plant. As in other networks of this type, subsystems of the network to be accessed by a central location for a comprehensive overview of the mine are often necessary. The following components are integral in creating access to a large automated mining infrastructure. Programmable logic controllers, or PLC, they control a subset or cell area of the mining process as well as the relevant devices in that cell area. Supervisory control and data acquisition, or SCADA, Systems which enable mining operators that have the ability to monitor the mining network from one central location. Distributed control systems, or DCS, provides a centralized control point for a localized part of the mining process. Human machine interfaces, or HMI, they act as a graphic interface used with PLC and DCS devices to control equipment within the mining process. AC drives, adjust the speed and torque of standard AC motors found in equipment, such as ventilation systems and conveyor belts. Sensors. Sensors detect movement, pressure, level or flow in a variety of mining applications. Metering and instrumentation. Devices that capture data such as power quality events that identify possible equipment damage, rock dust levels that indicate hazardous mining atmospheres, or shifting earth events that could cause tunnel collapses. And lastly, IP cameras, secure facility perimeters and are also used to monitor mining production. Network components of a cell area zone will differ from an enterprise zone because of the harsh environments and the need to keep operations running 24 seven. The components used on a typical plant floor are more rugged and built for endurance. Common components include Hardened switches are often DIN rail mounted and built to withstand harsh outdoor environments. They are sealed for moisture and particle protection and they can withstand the extreme temperatures commonly found in manufacturing. On machine switches are common in manufacturing because space on the manufacturing floor is limited and many devices actions require real time control. Many machines within the manufacturing process have embedded switches and technology that allows a variety of machines to be connected together. Security appliances are firewalls on the plant floor that provide an extra level of security to the cell area zone network, focusing on manufacturing productivity. Network address translation or NAT boxes act as a bridge between two networks, translating network IP addresses NATs allow multiple devices on one line to be configured with identical IP address settings. The physical architecture for a typical manufacturing enterprise is located in multiple areas that have unique environmental, security and performance considerations. Usual physical infrastructure architectures areas are industrial data center slash control room, network distribution, zone cabling enclosure, control panel, 
on machine devices. These physical locations can have differing needs based on the manufacturing operation that is being performed. For example, a process line may have longer distances and higher security requirements than a small assembly operation. But note, experts estimate that 50 to 90% of network disruptions are due to problems with this particular physical layer. Let us take a look at each of these areas in more detail. The physical layer of a converged network extends down to the level of each automated device. The amount of devices with direct Ethernet connections, such as sensors, drives and robotics, increases continually. There are two elements here to consider. The onboard machine or device itself, and how the embedded switches of the machine will fit into the topology. Hardening the exposed wiring or cabling and the connections that link each device to the network. For connections and wiring installed on machines, the exposure at different stages of an automated process needs to be taken into consideration. Devices may be located in areas that are exposed to extreme temperatures and dust particles and may also be in constant movement. Consider using ruggedized sealed switches and hardened media such as M12 connectors or sealed RJ45 to connect Ethernet to these devices. When it comes to network distribution design, the physical layer usually gets the least attention. Unique environmental impacts in manufacturing are often overlooked. Consequently, a significant portion of network downtime is attributed to physical layer connectivity. Unlike the quiet, temperature-controlled environment of an enterprise office, a manufacturing floor is loud and harsh. On the equipment floor, gear and cable is exposed to mechanical vibrations, ingress of water, dust and liquids, chemical exposures and temperature, and electromagnetic noise. Loose, unsecure wires are at risk of damage in this environment. Therefore, network design should consider shielding network distribution cables by utilizing sealed media with protective jackets, running cabling through conduit, investing in armored cabling, and utilizing rugged protective connectors. Using shielded cables in a poorly grounded and bonded building can cause damage to equipment and excessive communications errors due to ground loops. Proper termination of shields includes an equipotential grounding system. Shields help to reduce noise coupled to the balanced cables by providing a Faraday shield around the conductors. However, this is countered in some cable designs by using poorly balanced cable pairs. Shields can carry ground currents due to ground offsets within the building grounding system. These currents at worst case can cause equipment damage. At the least, the currents can be disruptive to the network communications. Ethernet IP reduces the chance of ground loops by isolating the shield at one end of the channel from the ground. This reduction is done through the use of an RC between the shield and local node ground connection. The RC is always in the device end and not at the switch end. The switch end of a shielded channel is always grounded if the switch is grounded. Now if properly grounded, shielded cables are useful in reducing communication error rates in the presence of high noise. The construction of a shielded cable is more complex than an unshielded twisted pair cable, or UTP, and therefore not as robust in flexing applications. Standards such as the TIA-568C2 and TIA-1005 standards set forth specifications for proper shielding and implementation of cables in the industrial network environment. While reducing noise and vibration are pertinent, noting that the rating of cabling is of wide concern for applications ranging from cabling of a network printer to cabling of an offshore oil rigs is worthwhile. Industrial automation control system devices and network infrastructure often include long cable runs in potentially non-controlled conditions such as humidity, varying temperatures and noise vibrations. These challenges are what IACS networks face that the typical enterprise networks do not face in the unique physical environment. Network design should take into consideration compliance regulations and potential environmental hazards. Elements such as harsh environmental conditions, long cable runs and expensive cable determine how the network topology for IACS networks is designed. Unlike IT networks, which often form redundant star topology networks, 
IACS network formations are driven by physical requirements, such as the series of interconnected motion devices of an assembly line. Alternative topologies such as linear, ring and star need also to be considered. In the mining industry, for example, there are several network topologies which are used for data transmission. The network topology selected for the wired and wireless sensor network largely depends on the area that needs to be covered. Considerations like data redundancy or energy optimization need to be taken into account. Recommended topologies, for example, include the ring topology, star topology and mesh topology. Every network topology has advantages and disadvantages, but in cases like the mining industry with many phases, i.e. extraction, transportation and processing, hybrid of topologies makes the most sense. Creating a secure connection that links onshore wells, offshore drilling, pipelines and refineries together in one global network poses many challenges. At the very least, the following issues must certainly be addressed the hazardous environments involved, remote collaboration between systems, and global experts needing to connect and collaborate across many, many miles. The high demand for oil and gas makes running operations continuously very critical. Networks within the oil and gas industry must be reliable and therefore require a high level of redundancy. Networks also need to be accessible by mobile devices and remote operational areas. To support these requirements, a combination of ring, dual ring and wireless network topologies are most often used. Other examples of the use of different topologies in an automation industry network are the topologies used in the Intelligent Transportation System Network. In order to provide real-time data and ensure consistent operations, ITS networks need to be resilient. ITS systems span over long distances and many of the devices involved are outdoors and therefore exposed to weather conditions. Taking those considerations into account, configuring ITS networks into linear, ring or layer 3 switching topologies is recommended. Networks that support multiple cell area zones may need to support multiple VLANs. In that case, a redundant layer 3 switching topology is recommended to run layer 3 switches and routers. Access layer switches typically function at the data link layer, or layer 2, of the OSI model. With layer 3 switching, there is an additional access layer of switches known as a distribution layer above the access layer. These switches interlink the various access layer switches and perform routing functions for this environment. In industrial Ethernet networks, an unmanaged loop is dangerous because broadcast and multicast messages are continuously bypassed until the network overloads called a broadcast storm. The standard protocol for this function is the spanning tree protocol. The more modern version is called rapid spanning tree protocol or RSTP. Spanning tree protocol was developed to manage redundant paths in a layer two network. The original spanning tree protocol has been considered too slow for industrial environments. To address these performance concerns, the IEEE standards committee has ratified the rapid spanning tree protocol 802.1w. This protocol provides sub-second convergence times that vary between 500 and 2000 milliseconds depending on network topology and size. Using 802.1w, organizations can achieve the benefits of redundant Ethernet networks with the performance and reliability that many manufacturing applications demand. Some industrial automation and control applications require faster convergence times than can be achieved with rapid spanning tree protocol or different variations and extensions of RSTP. Applications that require this rapid convergence time may require different convergence protocols. There are a number of different protocols that are appropriate for different applications and topologies, one of which is Resilient Ethernet Protocol. Resilient Ethernet Protocol, or REP, is a Cisco technology that is designed to achieve fast convergence in a ring topology or a variety of complex topologies. REP can achieve convergence times of less than 50 milliseconds in a ring topology of up to 50 switches. REP is a Cisco proprietary but is a segment technology and can inoperate with other protocols such as STP. The main benefit of using VLAN trunking protocol or VTP 
in a network environment is the ability to manage all configured VLANs across a switched network, including the ability to add, delete, and manage VLANs. In enterprise networks, this benefit is paramount. However, in industrial networks, such as the oil and gas industry networks, for example, this capability may present problems. An added switch can easily be misconfigured in server mode, thereby reverting versions and making unwanted VLAN configurations. Such changes could be difficult to correct without deploying personnel to remote and hard to reach areas. Therefore, in industrial networks, the use of VTP is not recommended. In manufacturing design guides, the recommendation is to use VTP protocol only in transparent mode and to manage VLANs on each switch manually. Multicasting is sending communications from a single transmitter to multiple receivers. Multicasting may include transmitting data from applications such as industrial network security system in closed caption TV. This need is most relevant in the safety of our infrastructure facilities like water or municipality stations where alarm notification and other settings can be implemented using multicasting as the mode of communications. Also protocols such as Goose use multicasting in this environment to send status messages to multiple substation intelligent electronic devices with one frame. On a mismanaged network, multicasting can cause broadcast storms. Multicast applications that are prevalent in manufacturing environments must be managed well using Internet Group Management Protocol or IGMP. IGMP manages multicast traffic by establishing a publish and subscribe mechanism. With IGMP, switches can process or snoop multicast traffic and determine which devices have subscribed to which multicast groups and send the traffic only to those devices that want the packets. IGMP snooping is used in the layer 2 switching environment to overcome the default behavior of network switches, which may again lead to redundant data and broadcast storms. In an industrial Ethernet network, running protocols such as CIP, IGMP snooping can limit unnecessary traffic from the I.O. device that it's producing, so the traffic only reaches a device consuming that data. Messages delivered to a particular device that were intended for other devices consume resources and slow performance, so networks with many multicasting devices will suffer performance issues if IGMP snooping or other multicast limiting schemes are not implemented. In this type of network, the devices and controllers must be grouped appropriately to optimize the flow of traffic within and between different cells. In the industrial automation network, connections are made through an interface on a router to your local network, to a distant site, or to the internet. Logical segmentation at layer 3 is important for the industrial automation network, especially for the converged plant-wide Ethernet implementation. In the cell area zone, endpoints that communicate implicit common industrial protocol, CIP, I.O. traffic to be in the same VLAN for traffic flow. In the manufacturing zone, the key segmentation considerations are traffic flow and security. A mix of physical separation and VLANs achieve segmentation and isolation. High availability of the routing infrastructure is critical to optimal performance. For an example, the Cisco CGR2010 is a modular platform with four slots to accommodate field replaceable GRWIC to add connectivity and services for substation, trackside and oil and gas communications. Routing begins at the level 3 IACS network, especially with distribution layer 3 switches. These switches route traffic between cell area IACS networks into VLAN or into the core, to other routers, or the DMZ. No routing occurs in the cell area IACS network itself. To provide for redundancy and dynamic alternate routing, a routing protocol should be used. The correct routing protocol to implement depends upon the network and includes distance vector routing protocols, RIPv1, RIPv2, and iGRIP, and link state routing protocols, OSPF and ISIS. Enhanced Interior Gateway Routing Protocol, or EIGRP, is a hybrid that has characteristics of both distance vector and link state routing protocols. Every router involved needs to be aware of network topology changes. 
The convergence time for a routing protocol is the same needed for the network topology to converge in such a way that the router part of the network topology has a consistent network view and has the latest routing information for all networks within the topology. A routing protocol should be able to handle new networks. OSPF or EIGRP are recommended as core routing protocols because of their fast convergence. Every industrial automation control system network device on the industrial Ethernet network is assigned an IP address and is addressable within the manufacturing zone. Essential considerations include IP address management, address space planning, hierarchical addressing, and summarization. Keeping future expansion in mind is absolutely critical. NAT is a service that allows the assignment of a unique public IP address to an existing private IP address, end device. Many industrial devices have the same default IP addresses in factory machine nodes, wind turbines, metro control systems, and traffic lighting systems. NAT solves the problem of communication between devices with the same IP address. Another reason NAT is attractive to automation networking is the opportunity to reuse IP address schemes for different parts of the network. By reusing IP address schemes, manufacturers and their partners reduce the test and implementation time of systems or lines on the plant floor. This reduction comes by repeating the IP address scheme for different parts of the network. The network address translation process of swapping one address for another is separate from the convention that is used to determine what is public and private, and devices must be configured to recognize which addresses are to be translated. One-to-one -one Layer 2 NAT allows the assignment of a unique public IP address to an existing private IP address end device. For example, Layer 2 NAT could be used to translate addresses between devices such as Programmable Logical Controllers PLCs, on one network and Human to Machine Interface HMI, on another network. This assignment allows the end device to communicate on both the inside and outside networks. This service is configured in an NAT-enabled switch and is the public alias of the IP address that is physically programmed on the end device. This function is typically represented by a table in the NAT device. Layer 2 NAT has two translation tables where private to public and public to private subnet translations can be defined. Layer 2 NAT is a hardware-based implementation that provides the same high level of bump-on-the-wire performance through switch loading. This implementation also supports multiple VLANs through the NAT boundary for enhanced network segmentation. Layer 3 NAT translates between IP addresses and can also be deployed internally where there is a clash of private IP addresses. Usually, Layer 3 NAT connects two networks and translates the inside local address in the internal network to outside network addresses before packets are forwarded to another network. An industrial network may come in a wide range of sizes, from small factory solutions to extremely large plant complexes. A network may include a few network infrastructure devices to many thousands. CPWE architecture concepts and recommendations need to accommodate this wide range in number of devices. One of these new concepts is the development of IPv6. Multiple benefits are available from the adoption of IPv6 in the automation industry. For example, one potential benefit is the dynamic aspect of IP address assignment, allowing zero-touch provisioning of devices. Auto-configuration enables plug-and-play capabilities and allows devices to be connected to the network without any configuration and without the need for stateful servers such as DHCP servers. Streamlined header structures make processing IPv6 packets faster and more efficient for immediate routers within the network. IPv6 also includes a rich set of transition tools to allow an easy, non-disruptive transition over time to IPv6 dominant networks, which enables the Internet of Things, because of the possibility of having enough addressing for any type of device needed to connect to the network. The benefit of IPv6 in automation technology is more than just a simple quadrupling of the existing 32-bit IPv4 address to a 128-bit address to increase the number of IP addresses. The massively expanded address space also allows us to do without the previously introduced address conversions 
due to limited IPv4 address space. This space allows problem-free direct communication between end systems without the issues resulting from network address translation. In this lesson, we will present the use of wireless technologies in the industrial network environment and take a look at some of the common implementations. With devices that are in constant motion, wireless solutions such as Wi-Fi enabled devices are becoming more popular in industrial automation network applications. A variety of wireless communications technologies have been considered for industrial networks such as oil and gas, mining and intelligent transportation systems. UHF and VHF radio communications are often used for short and long-range communication. Short-range Wi-Fi communications, or more specifically WAVE, or the dedicated short-range communication standards, are recommended by the Intelligent Transportation Society of America and the United States Department of Transportation to establish communication between devices in close proximity. Longer-range WiMAX, Global System for Mobile Communications, 3G or 4G communications have been proposed using already existing networks. Industrial wireless demands are met in multiple form factors, often including serial ports for accessibility and cellular connectivity. Wi-Fi can be used for communicating between WLAN equipped devices, including laptops, card readers, fingerprint scanners and point of sale terminals. The Wi-Fi may simultaneously switch from communicating over cellular to Wi-Fi when inside the range of its designated access point, example a depot or service bay, while maintaining connection to the WLAN devices. This application can be used in rugged conditions providing a mesh solution for failover if needed. Input-output applications. Wireless LANs can be used for digital and analog input-output interfaces to monitor sensors and control digital relays and switches while using the serial ports to collect data from a programmable logic controller, data logger, or to remotely control serial equipment. The I.O. device enables a wide variety of monitoring applications such as doors, sirens, locks, temperature, humidity, or even gas pressure. Wireless networks are a critical component in creating a unified mining or oil and gas network where there are harsh environmental conditions, long-haul pipelines, and many remote onshore and offshore drilling sites. Wireless devices are more vulnerable to environmental conditions than hardwired solutions. There are challenges with implementing wireless devices within the harsh environments and quite often hazardous conditions surrounding the oil and gas industry. However, the implementation of wireless technology is necessary to connect the far spread global oil and gas infrastructure and enable mobility. When developing a wireless approach, the effects of conditions like extreme hot and cold temperatures, outdoor exposure to sun, wind and rain, and loud vibrating machinery on wireless equipment need to be taken into consideration. When selecting wireless products, look for rugged and hardened devices that are rated for harsh environments such as ATEX Div 1, 2, Zone 2, rated for extreme temperatures, and protected against dust particles and moisture. Wireless refinery solutions provide a converged standards-based architecture for oil and gas refinery applications that monitor and gather data right down to the sensor level. Wireless refinery solutions help oil and gas operators to improve operational efficiency, create and adjust business processes, comprehensively manage the refinery site. A secure wireless architecture for the oil and gas industry consists of the following components. A wireless sensor network. This network contains a series of automated sensors that can track real-time movement, monitor conditions, and log access to facilities and the network, for example. This level of detail supports consistent condition-based monitoring to assure high performance from equipment at all times. A wireless backhaul network. This network tracks network assets by storing and transmitting data from the sensor network to the services. Services. These services make use of data collected from the backhaul and sensor networks by categorizing and organizing the data. And finally, applications. Applications within the architecture rely on categorized data entries to determine if a security breach has taken place or if a process needs to be altered due to unusual conditions within the system. Together, all these components allow oil and gas operators the visibility needed to maintain smooth running operations 
and to ensure that assets are well protected. Fast roaming WLAN networks are often used in intelligent transportation systems in order to quickly connect and transmit data between devices that do not stay in one place. On vehicle devices, for instance, travel with the vehicle and therefore need to connect with stationary receivers quickly before the vehicles are out of range. The use of fast roaming WLANs makes these connections possible. Some benefits of using this solution include the following. Standard cost-effective WLAN equipment. WLAN coverage in areas without public 3G or 4G connectivity, such as in tunnels or underground. Highly available and redundant network. And of course, privacy and security of data. Management of complex mining operations cannot be successful without high capacity, reliable networks, such as wireless, that can connect field personnel with headquarters and other locations. The application of wireless communications has enabled huge gains in productivity and safety while reducing maintenance and downtime in open pit and underground mining operations. Mines must continuously operate, therefore a stable, reliable network connecting the pits and tunnels to the surface control centre is crucial. A reliable network not only reduces downtime but ensures that real-time information is available to support operations. Developing a site with a wireless profile approach is essential, but considerations must be made based on the characteristics of the mine. Surface mines, such as open pit operations, mountaintop removal operations or strip mining, have very different features than those of underground tunnel mining. Surface mining sites demand the need for wireless voice, data and video communications, and real-time status details. However, the changing landscape of open pit mines make deploying and then redeploying necessary and simple for the network. Wireless mesh nodes are often used at surface mining sites since the mesh nodes are designed to locate one another quickly and establish connectivity without operator intervention. Wireless mesh technology provides high connectivity, low lag and jitter and allows the mobility required for ever-changing surface mine environments. In a transportation phase, nodes may be in motion relative to each other and to fixed devices on the network, yet the nodes must remain connected. Mining operations often monitor the productivity of transport vehicles and report status details back to management. In addition, visual observation through IP cameras mounted on mining vehicles enables the control center to respond to situations remotely. Extending the network into the mine also enables phone services in areas that are often too remote for cellular service. Using a wireless mesh approach, GPS capability can be used to locate any of the nodes and the respective host vehicle within the mine. While WLAN has many benefits, WLAN has also several limitations. On sites as large as a mining site, multiple antennas need to be installed. For a typical plant, this installation is fine. However, on mining sites, the earth is always changing due to expanding pits and extended tunnels. In order to stay connected, antennas may need to be moved or added periodically. In addition, the need for backhaul connections may be required to support downtime during equipment moves. To combat these challenges, private cellular networks may provide a solution. Private Long-Term Evolution LTE, networks have been used to enable technology for a vehicle autonomy in mines. A truck holding an LTE-capable router can connect to an LTE access network for application control and monitoring. LTE networks are cost-effective and can be implemented with only a few towers and minimal backhaul. Additionally, LTE networks can be run either by the enterprise, a systems integrator, or a mobile service provider. This implementation provides a stable network that ensures that autonomous haul trucks are always connected and operating at full capacity. In addition, this solution provides centralized and dedicated policy and control capabilities, allowing mine operations to effectively prioritize all autonomy control traffic above any other network application. In this lesson, we will discuss the needs of security within the automation network, as well as the difference in focus between enterprise network and industrial network security deployments. As we have seen, industrial environments are becoming increasingly more networked. Due to the harsh environments, changing device positions and remote underground locations, real-time wireless communications are used to transmit data, voice and video packets across the network. In addition, 
Handheld mobile devices used to control equipment and processes throughout these environments are becoming much more popular. While these network advancements improve mining efficiently, these advancements also open the mining industry up to potential security risks. Industrial networks need to take security measures into consideration such as firewalls, VPN access and encryption. There are some fundamental differences in the way security in IT networks and industrial networks is implemented. IT focuses on protecting intellectual property and company assets, while the prime focus of an industrial network is to ensure operations are always running. Security policies are a prime example of cultural and organizational convergence differences between IT networks and manufacturing controls networks. From the perspective of an IT department, security should be pervasive. The focus is on protecting company assets and intellectual property, so the top priority is to protect data confidentiality, followed by integrity, and then data availability, CIA in order. Typically, security enforcement is implemented in that order, a priority. From the perspective of an industrial department, security is open by default and closed by configuration. Industrial security policies focus on continuous manufacturing operation or data availability as the top priority. Because of this, industrial security policies protect data, availability, integrity, and then data confidentiality, or AIC, in that order. Although the use of defense in-depth security frameworks within industrial networks is rapidly growing. Mitigating security risks is becoming critical as the infrastructure of our nation may be exposed. For example, in 2009, a Texas municipality water plant was exploited and the intruder was able to alter the sensor value of a tank, causing an overflow and costing millions in damages. Also, in 2010, a virus known as Stuxnet was designed specifically to attack a plant PLC, exploiting Siemens Step 7 software. DoQ and Flame were both similar exploits infecting tech machines via USB, then spreading throughout industrial networks. Whether mining, intelligent transportation systems, oil and gas, water, wastewater plants or power plants, observing security best practices are critical. Recent government regulations around grid security are driving utilities companies to implement new operating procedures. The North American Electric Reliability Corporation, for example, was commissioned by the Department of Energy to implement Critical Infrastructure Protection, or CIP, standards for which utilities must comply. Utilities must demonstrate that the Electronic Security Perimeter, ESP, zones around critical cyber assets have been created in transmission facilities. These requirements are driving utilities to implement new communications procedures to ensure compliance and avoid hefty fines for non-compliance. The current NERC CIP standards regulate security measures for bulk electric systems, including power generation and transmission facilities. Substation network security is one of the most critical requirements that can impact substation operation reliability and availability. Key security principles include providing access control, data confidentiality and data privacy, threat detection and mitigation, as well as device and platform integrity. The purpose of access control is to ensure that network access is limited to only authorized personnel and only valid devices are part of the grid network. The access control can be achieved by using role-based access control with AAA for users and authenticating every device and application connected to the grid, such as routers, switches, servers, workstations and IEDs. The goal of using network segmentation, secure connectivity and encryption is to ensure data privacy and integrity for customer data and data integrity, and confidentiality for technical data belonging to the utility. The purpose of threat detection and mitigation is to protect critical assets against cyber attacks and insider threats. VLANs, access lists, firewalls and intrusion prevention systems, as well as device logs, are used to provide threat detection and mitigation. Another important security principle is to provide device and platform integrity to ensure that devices and meters cannot be compromised easily and are resistant to cyber attacks. These security services should be deployed at each networking protocol layer whenever the security services are applicable. Complete substation network security should include the deployment of security solutions from OSI layers 2, 3 and 4. 
Substation security management addresses security requirements from three perspectives. Security service provisioning, network security monitoring, and regulation of standard compliance. For each of these security management areas, substation network availability and attack resilience are the primary objectives. Other network data protection requirements include data integrity and data confidentiality. Security Event Management, or SEM, is a component of substation security, which processes security-related event data in real time for threat management, malicious activity, and incident response. The sources of event data include firewalls, intrusive prevention and detection systems, networking devices, security software, logs of host activity, and so on. Security Information Management, or SIM, is the critical part of substation network management, which is responsible for log data analyzing for compliance reporting, user privileges, and resource access. The sources of log data are monitoring from host system and security logs, directories and access management, IAM, systems, transaction logs, and various application logs. In the oil and gas industry, employees being able to access the network from remote areas is critical. Between employees isolated at drilling sites and those performing roaming pipeline maintenance, the use of remote VPN access enables authorized people to securely access the network from any location. Remote access VPN solutions include the following options. Clientless SSL VPN provides limited network access and is an ideal solution for vendors and contractors who should have restricted access to a very controlled set of resources. Full Network SSL VPN enables our users to access any resource on the network, including applications, and is an ideal solution for those who need remote access to the same network resources users need in the office. And lastly, IPsec-based VPN enables remote access through a pre-installed VPN client software on the user desktop. This solution is primarily used on company-owned computers and is ideal for managing VPN access. Advanced security policies are implemented to limit remote access to authorized people. Such strategies are important for oil and gas producers whose workers are often situated at remote locations and utilize a variety of mobile equipment. Using a multiple defense in-depth approach for seamless, always-on remote client compliance is recommended. With this approach, the remote clients will be provided with convenient connectivity while enhancing infrastructure security and decreasing the total cost of ownership for the enterprise. Cisco security solutions promote information and system security with a full suite of industry-leading firewalls, next-generation equipment, intrusion detection, network management, client security, and other critical control measures. Physical security is the most important form of security. Equipment used in your control system must be protected from physical damage unauthorized access or destruction. Access to any equipment by visitors and personnel must be controlled and monitored. There are several physical security options available, for example, in utility environments, from the basic fence protection to automated video surveillance systems. When developing a security solution, utility owners should consider the following. Restricting access to facilities with gates or fencing. Utilize access badges, restricted key systems or security tokens to limit access to authorized personnel. Deploy identity measures such as photo IDs and visitor passes to manage access to company property. Monitor entry to critical areas and facility perimeters using alarm systems. Record and store video surveillance. Post signage to warm off potential intruders. The physical security devices rely on an IP network infrastructure to route video streams and alarm events to monitoring centers and recording devices for logging purposes. There are various important substation physical security components such as the following. Badge readers, deployed at every access point and are able to identify and grant access to authorized personnel. The access gateways communicate with the physical access manager at the operations center and the authorization request is granted via the LDAP or Active Directory server. Video surveillance. IP cameras may support power over Ethernet, PoE, and wireless connectivity. The goal of the IP cameras is to protect the perimeter gate of the substation and access door to the control house. The video streams are recorded locally at the substation at a ruggedized media server. The operations manager at the operations center is able to manage cameras, 
and media servers located at a large number of substations. In this lesson, we will discuss the role of additional support protocols in the industrial network, such as timing protocols and network management. We will also review the challenges and benefits of convergence in the industrial network. Real-time communications is critical in many industrial applications. For example, sub-millisecond timestamps are common requirements in the power industry where the sequence and timing of events is critical. These events and timestamps capture dedicated input-output modules that are designed for this purpose, timestamping relays and many other accurate time-based devices. Determinism, or the predictability of performance, is another key requirement for industrial networks especially for device-level control and controller interlocking. The main impact of the network on system predictability is based on the following network performance characteristics. Latency, which is the average amount of time a message takes to be transmitted and processed from an originating node to a destination node. And jitter, which is the amount of variance in the latency. The goal in a control network is to have both of these minimized through network capacity and quality of service implementation. In an industrial substation, for example, precise timing synchronization is required to ensure that measuring devices that are connected to the utility grid have accurate clocks. The accuracy of the clock is measured based on a national standard and can range from millisecond to microsecond depending on the application. The following items are examples of measuring devices that require precise timing synchronization. Fault recorders record power faults and disturbances and generate a timestamp when an important event occurs. Events are recorded at the substation and are transmitted to a central location for analysis. Accuracy within one millisecond is typically required for this kind of analysis. Sequence of event recorders produce a chronological list of state changes within a monitored device. State changes are timestamped and transmitted to a central source for real-time or post-disturbance analysis. To compare which event occurred before the other, timestamps of one millisecond accuracy are required. Phaser measuring units continuously measure voltage and current, as well as frequency of transmission lines. Measurements are timestamped and sent to a centrally located server for further analysis. Synchronizing timestamps from all substations and providing measuring accuracy of within one millisecond is also important to perform accurate phaser analysis. Accurate clocks enable sophisticated analysis of real-time and post-disturbance faults and events within a short amount of time. This analysis leads to faster and more reliable fault isolation and resolution, and better planning of transmission resources on the electric grid. Precise time information is critical in decentralized automated systems. This capability is not present in the default asynchronous environment of the Ethernet packet switch network. The use of Network Time Protocol NTP, does not provide the timing accuracy needed. Whereas Precision Time Protocol meets the accuracy requirements of the industrial network environment. With PTP Protocol, synchronizing clocks that are driving robots in multiple manufacturing plants that are distributed across Ethernet networks to within an accuracy of less than one millisecond is possible. In an automation network, PTP may need to be the first item implemented. QoS is the ability of the network to predictably provide applications with the service level that is required to successfully use those applications. There are many different kinds of traffic that exist in modern automation industry networks, like industrial protocols, CIP, Profinet, and Modbus TCP, IEEE 1588v2, PTP, video, voice management, and other data traffic. In an industrial Ethernet application, for example, Real-time input-output control traffic would share network resources with administrative data, such as explicit data, configuration files, FTP for example, and data collection flows, as well as other traffic in the lower layers of the OSI reference model. Also, as a converged network environment, providing correct handling of the different data types in industrial networks is essential. Delay of time-critical data in an environment such as wastewater network could lead to disastrous consequences. By using QoS to give high priority to real-time UDP control traffic, organizations can realize the benefit of sharing resources, yet maintain the real-time network characteristics required for I.O. control traffic in industrial automation and control applications. 
The QoS feature allows you to select specific network traffic, prioritize the traffic according to relative importance, and configure congestion management, as well as congestion avoidance techniques to provide preferential treatment. The network is the foundation of a smart grid for utilities companies as well as other industrial applications. That is why network management frameworks should be considered. Network management allows utilities to access devices, make management decisions based on the information available, and apply necessary changes. Protocols such as Simple Network Management Protocol, or SNMP, should tie into energy management networks in the smart grid, for example to offer configuration management and secure updates to network devices to ensure uninterrupted operations. Active monitoring of network device status is a requirement in control networks and protocols such as SNP and NetFlow provide this functionality. Configuration management is essential and configurations must be saved in the central location. Protocols such as Secure Shell should be used for secure access to your device management interface. RADIUS and TACACS Plus can be used to provide secure authenticated access for system administrators. Performance monitoring is also important in your network management infrastructure because it allows proactive monitoring of system utilization and performance to prevent system failures. As we have seen, convergence in the automation industry network helps businesses achieve business goals through the implementation of standardized protocols. Business goals may include increased agility and responsiveness, cost-effective strategies for transforming business processes, and enterprise-wide visibility for sharing of data. However, there can also be challenges to this goal. Manufacturers have many systems and implement protocols with many layers that may not communicate well together. Integration of applications and development of converged systems can be costly and time-consuming without proper coordination. Also, separation in organizational structures between IT and manufacturing can result in poor resource allocation, information exchange, and therefore present integration challenges. As an example, the Cisco Intelligence Station architecture is a fully converged IP-based network in an industrial automation system. This architecture provides reliable communications for all transit operations, commuter information, and security systems. In this converged network, the combined voice, video, and data network provides quick and accurate passenger information while enabling fare collection, as well as security and facility management. The intelligence station also supports passenger services such as wireless connectivity in waiting areas. The converged Cisco intelligence station utilizes a combination of wired and wireless networks to support all facets of transit, such as security, rail management, and the ability to support future growth. Data used to operate the system can be securely accessed from anywhere, including mobile devices, providing security personnel access to streaming surveillance, or allowing maintenance workers to access repair histories. Another example of a converged industrial network is the connected gas or oil pipeline. On a connected gas or oil pipeline, a modernized converged access network solution will allow the following benefits. Field personnel to have access to network information and expert collaboration via mobile wireless hotspots. Enhanced personnel and equipment safety through real-time tracking and alerts and safety security surveillance. Operational integrity through automated alert and notification systems. Access to status information and operational reports through real-time analytics. And on-demand collaboration and expert support through mobile handheld devices such as cell phones and tablets. As we can see from these examples, if properly managed, the benefits of convergence outweigh the challenges of implementation. The following key points were discussed in this module. The technologies that are implemented in a traditional automation industry network are often purpose-built and vendor-specific. Open communication between devices is driving the migration from proprietary field bus protocols to Ethernet. Industrial cell area zone networks that use industrial automation control systems, or IACS, require different topologies and configurations than typical enterprise networks. Network components of a cell area zone will differ from an enterprise zone because of the harsh environments and the need to keep operations running 24 hours per day and 7 days a week. A variety of wireless communications are being used for industrial networks such as oil and gas, mining and intelligent transportation systems. 
There are some fundamental differences in the way security in IT networks and industrial networks are implemented. Real-time communications is critical in many industrial applications, therefore the implementation of protocols such as PTP is a key. Remote control and monitoring have become increasingly important in modern industrial networks for network efficiency as well as safety.